Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to our talk. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is uh, Velička Tanasuva. I'm an engineering manager in the open source program office of VMware. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, it's my first time in Berlin and attending this wonderful event. It's, I'm really enjoying it. Hey, I'm uh, Radia Radoslava Jeleva, and I'm an open source program manager in uh, VMware's open source program office. My first time here as well, so I hope you enjoy our talk. And today we are going to cover dependencies, uh, the dependency graph, uh, what we consider the most common dependency risks, uh, dependency risk management and mitigation, and in the end, we would like to give you our key takeaways that we would like you to leave us uh, from the talk today. A couple of uh, great talks today already touched on dependencies, on dependency graph and the risks that come with dependencies. Hopefully, uh, we'll add to that our insights, uh, useful tips, how to manage dependencies and risks. We'll start uh, with a simple definition of a dependency. A dependency is a piece of software that another piece of software uh, depends on to operate. There are different types of dependencies. Some dependencies are used directly. We refer to those as direct dependencies. Others are pulled in by another dependency. We refer to those as transitive or indirect dependencies. Tools that build software use build dependencies. And uh, in order for the software to run to execute, we need runtime dependencies. All those types of dependencies do the heavy lifting for us when it comes to dealing with common challenges. Leveraging existing solutions helps us focus on our uni unique innovation and bring it to life so much faster. And that's a great software development approach. We vote with two hands uh, for that uh, software development approach. Depending on third-party uh, dependencies, however, comes with risks. Um, every third-party dependency that we use comes with its dependencies, and they drag along their dependencies. And we end up with uh, tons of known and unknown dependencies. We start to depend not just on our own code that we know very well with all of its imperfections, but we also depend on code that we don't know. We don't know who created the code. Sometimes we don't know who maintains the code, if somebody's still maintaining that code. And that's risky. Let me put it in perspective for you. This is a dependency graph of a real life uh, open source project. It's an inspection tool that is used for scanning uh, container images and looking for compliance metadata in the software packages that are installed in the image. It's not that bad, not so many dependencies. It's not so difficult to count them, to track them, to see what depends on what. Let's move to the next level another dependency graph of another open source project, this time for supply chain security and signing container images. This one is much more beautiful, right? A lot of dependencies. I cannot track what depends on what, what goes where. It's even intimidating to me. And these are, this is how the, the dependency graphs of modern apps look like. The more dependencies, the more risks come with them. Ready? Do you want to tell us what can go wrong? Yeah, when it's usually a bit of bear of bad news. So when it comes to dependency management and when it basically through the whole software development lifecycle, you're going to be faced with different kinds of risk. You are going to find a different way to manage them and mitigate them. And when it comes to dependency management, that's just another way to manage those risks. The most common associated risk with dependency and open source dependencies, those are open source license compliance risks and security risks. So what's open source license compliance risk? Usually uh, those are risks associated uh, with violations of the terms and conditions of the open source licenses of those dependencies, as well as copyright and uh, intellectual property violations. And we would like to share with you what could happen. 
Hypothetically, there is an organization that is developed and distributed an open source project, uh, project using open source components. For some reason, they don't have an OSPO, for example. They never inventory their dependencies. They never or insufficiently inventory them. They never identify the direct and transitive dependencies and their licenses. And let's take, uh, for example, one of those dependencies has a GPL 2.0 license. They never, because they don't know what they're using, they never made the proper disclosure, source code disclosure, copyright uh, attribution. So what could happen? Hypothetically, the code's author or copyright holder can decide to take legal action. Um, worst case scenario, that could be litigation. A judge could rule in favor of the plaintiff, aka copyright holder. Uh, and the organization may face very broad range of consequences, legal business consequences. They can be sustain, uh, substantial financial penalties, product shipment suspension, product rebuild to remove the software they're using and they don't want to disclose. So all of those legal consequences lead to <laughs> business consequences, loss of revenue from the product shipment suspension or product rebuild, uh, loss of reputation, uh, customer support difficulties, because if you don't ship your pro project, you can't support your customers that are paying for it. And at the end, what that means for your business and your reputation, company reputation, your uh, reputation in the open source community, the community can basically lose trust in you and your company. So that was a hypothetical and what actually had happened in the his, basic history of open source and open source litigation. Let's take, for example, BusyBox litigation from 2007, I guess, to 2013. Uh, during that period, the open source conservancy has filed uh, a series of lawsuits. I'm sorry, guys, I'm kind of nervous here. My new boss is over there and watching me. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to become. <laughs> so during that period, uh, the Open Source Confer Conservancy has filed a series of lawsuits uh, on behalf of the uh, principal developers of BusyBox. And all of the lawsuits uh, were uh, have been claiming uh, infringement, uh, intellectual property infringement, and the most common violation in all of the lawsuits was failure to disclose the use, basically the use of BusyBox and all of the software under the GPL uh, 2.0 software. So let's move to security risks. Uh, security risks may range from minor to catastrophic, and they can affect millions of unsuspected people. And I know that could be tra quite a dramatic statement. I'm quite a dramatic person, says you, <laughs> person as you may see now. But that is something uh, that had become reality for more than 104, 145 million uh, people back in 2017 when the Equifax's data breach happened. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard about the incident or don't know what Equifax is. Equifax uh, is an American uh, uh, multinational consumer reporting agency. Uh, they assess the financial health of uh, US citizens and other citizens around the world. And because of that, they have access and operate with a huge amount of personal, personally identifying data. And from uh, the publicly reported data, what we know is that Equifax's system has been using Stra Apache Strat's uh, library uh, with non-security vulnerabilities. For some reason, even after uh, the vulnerabilities in the library was patched, uh, Apache Foundation announced uh, the, uh, the tracing of the security issues, uh, the Equifax's uh, team didn't upgrade their systems which led to the exploitation of the systems and the data breach that went unnoticed for a few, uh, for a few months. 
And then what happened? What were the consequences and why I'm saying millions of people? Basically, former CEO testified it in front of Congress. Well, a class action lawsuit was filed and a settlement was approved and billions of dollars, and I say that billions with a B, was spent in the aftermath of the, of the incident in penalties, um, damages, fines. So that's a quite an extreme example of why dependency management really, uh, really matters and how by... Uh, identifying the risks as early as possible and mitigating them can actually help you avoid managing crisis later. Enough horror stories. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all that. But let's not panic and let's try to take a relatively safe approach towards managing dependencies. There is uh, such a wide variety of uh, software libraries out there that can help you, uh, help you, help us achieve our goals and help us innovate faster. But how do we choose the right ones? Let's do it wisely. Wise people uh, use um, multiple criteria to choose amongst alternatives. And one of them is licensing. Um, Open source dependencies come with open source licenses and not all of licenses are equal. So when you're using or you think about using an open source dependencies, it's really a good practice to consider your project, its needs, your ecosystem, uh, your internal policy for use if you have such policy. Uh, at the end of the day, open source software is free to use, inspect, modify, and distribute, but we still need to do it uh, within the terms and conditions of the open source licenses that govern it. And if you are not willing to comply with it, just don't use the software, right? <laughs> so, oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, when choosing a dependency, consider, are you bringing in just the functionality that you need or a lot more? In this particular case, less is better. The more complex the dependency, the higher potential for bugs and the larger attack service. When you're looking at a GitHub repository, don't be tempted to weigh up uh, the project's vitality uh, by GitHub uh, watches, uh, stars, forks, etc. These are pseudo statistics and they don't provide accurate project health information. You'd better look at the open issues, uh, the pull requests, uh, their resolution time, how active the community is, the contributors, the governors, that sort of stuff would provide more accurate information on the project health. When choosing a dependency, pick one that has a well-documented design and high code quality. Because you never know, sometime, someday you might need to debug some problem. You'd better, it, you better make it easy for you at that time. Okay, another thing to consider is test coverage. Uh, pick dependencies that have uh, high test coverage and well-maintained test suite. This, uh, provide some uh, comfort that the project actually does what it's meant to do. And if uh, the dependency lacks good uh, test coverage, um, someday uh, unexpected bugs might, might surface and uh, break your users. Security. Do your best to pick uh, dependencies that have well-established security response policy. This is how the community handles security vulnerabilities, how they respond to reporters who report the security vulnerability, how they triage, how they mitigate, how they disclose the issues. Inexistent or poor uh, security response policy might um, expose your project to attacks once security vulnerabilities are discovered. Adoption is another important criteria to consider. Widely adopted projects, uh, they enjoy more attention and uh, it's more likely that all existing bugs, most of, most of the existing bugs, are already uh, discovered and resolved. 
these projects are usually a safer bet than projects with relatively few users. Okay, so we were wise enough, we applied multiple criteria, and we chose the, chose the right dependencies. What's next? So I guess we should track them, right? It would and be nice. track <laughs> and tracking them could be a big challenge, where to start, what exactly to track, how often do you do it. So our suggestion will be, apart from having an OSPO, right, uh, to start with establishing internal policy for use and distribution of open source uh, software. Uh, and as I said earlier, your internal policy should be really based on your willingness to comply with the open source licenses. Uh, because if you're not willing to comply with it or you're wondering uh, how can I get away with it, we know from history that people rarely get away with it. So just make sure that your policy uh, is designed in a way that help your teams make uh, informed decisions and you don't need uh, to rebuild your products later. Next will be to introduce uh, a review process. And the review process should be designed in a way that helps you uh, facilitate the policy and, com uh, and comply with the policy. Uh, when it comes to review processes and you're just starting, uh, th they don't need to be uh, unnecessarily complex. Uh, for your needs, just scale them to your needs. Uh, in my opinion, the basics are to inventory uh, the, the, I'm sorry, I lost the word, uh, the dependencies <laughs> you are using and distributing uh, to perform a due diligence, open source license due diligence, and uh, to track uh, your dependencies. And at the end of the, uh, the day, uh, successful review process is really one that is done as early as possible in the software development life cycle, done diligently, uh, and doesn't end with the first release of your project. It should be done through your project life cycle. Next would be to introduce some tooling solution. And really the tooling solution here is to help you facilitate your review process. Uh, when it comes to tooling, there is so many different kinds of tools, proprietary ones, open source ones, you can even opt to develop your own internal tool. And again, the tooling solution you choose should be really sc uh, scaled to your needs. The basics here are to think, is it uh, compatible with, uh, with your build and pipeline uh, management systems? Who is going to use it? Who is going to maintain it? What are the associated costs with it? And once you get those answers for yourself, you will be able to choose the right solution for you. Great job. So we chose our dependencies widely. We are tracking them properly. There is something else we need to do. Our project, as well as its dependencies, evolve over time, each at their own speed. Is there somebody in the room who still needs convincing that we need to update our dependencies. Nope, perfect. Okay, yes, we need to update them, but again, wisely, not just rush and... <laughs> Are you against updating? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we need to do that uh, wisely. New versions of dependencies might contain uh, security fixes, critical bug fixes, or new features. Before rushing into upgrading, um, spend some time to understand what the changes are and uh, what's the urgency. Is it needed to do it right away or it can wait a little bit? The deep, if, let's say that uh, the the version of the dependency addresses some uh, security vulnerability. Try to figure if this security vulnerability is actually affecting you. If you are unlucky, 
and the severity of the problem is medium or higher, we need to, you need to upgrade with a higher priority. It's the same with critical bugs. If the new version contains a new feature, uh, which uh, is of value to delivering new software solutions, that's a great addition, but it's not that urgent in nature. Even less urgent are new features that don't have current use case. Before, uh, to, to complete your upgrade, you also need to estimate the effort and to allocate enough time uh, to adjust your code so that it addresses any breaking changes and to introduce uh, new test cases um, whenever necessary. You need to run all your tests to make sure that everything works as expected and you're not introducing um, some regression. You need to update the documentation and the release notes. And finally, you need to repackage and release your project. Be careful about outdated dependencies. If for some reason a dependency is not supported anymore, it is highly recommended that you find an alternative that is actively supported. Unfortunately, this is not always uh, possible. If it's not possible, you need to assume maintenance and patch it in your version. And remember, uh, open source is free to use, to modify, to distribute, but it's not just like enjoying a free beer. It's more like taking care of a puppy that you got for free. <laughs> <laughs> the, moment, the moment it becomes part of your life, you need to start caring to take care of, of, of it. How you're going to do it depends on the puppy's needs, on your family and home specifics, but it definitely requires some time and effort. And it's absolutely the, oops, sorry. No problem. Sorry. Uh, it's absolutely the same with open source dependencies. The moment you adopt them, you need to take care of them. How you're going to do it depends on your project usage, team, company, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Yeah, and but you just need yeah, to, to spend time and uh, effort on that. And your approach towards dependency management will most probably evolve over time. You'll be getting better in uh, identifying risk, managing risk, and so will be the, the, the challenges. They'll be getting harder. Um, but that's OK. That's life, uh, as long as uh, you keep dependency management on your agenda. Yeah, and as you just got a preview I'm of sorry. my daughter, uh, real life risks and crisis. Uh, and as promised earlier, our key takeaways for you from today's talk is to establish internal policies and processes to inventory, track, and update your dependencies, to introduce tooling solution that's actually scalable to your needs, and at the end, just be mindful and make sure you implement dependency risk management in your product development life cycle. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful talk. Um, so we still have some time for questions. Um, who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, okay. So I have a question about the tooling. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that you can either use like existing solution or build your own. So can you give some examples for that? Uh, for uh, proprietary tooling? Yeah, like what can it help you track and how? Yeah. So, oh. I'm sorry, uh, over there next. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to tooling, uh, it really depends on your project and your needs. Uh, if you have a very small project and you're using only two open source libraries, then probably you don't need to pay for Black Duck or any other proprietary tool. But that will help you just make sure you know what's exactly in that uh, dependency. Right, because each dependency can have their own direct and transitive dependencies, as we are hearing today all day long, right? So you just 
You can go and manually do it if there are a few of them, but if you have a project that uh, we actually have a project a service that is using more than uh, 3,000 uh, open source dependencies, so in this case, you probably will need uh, some proprietary solution that can help you be integrated your, with your internal pipeline management and build systems to help you identify uh, the dependencies. I see. Makes sense. Um, we hadn't. Did we have? Yeah. Uh, I work on op on tooling for this thing, so I have a talk tomorrow. One tip for the people in the room when you look at this tooling, especially commercial tooling, most tools are security tools and not license compliance tools. When you look at your dependency from the tool that whatever you're doing a demo of everything's for, ask them to show the actual license in the actual source code package. You will find that 99% of the commercial tools cannot do this. And just make a remark, like when you say building your own tools, we had a whole session at FOSDEM. People, please stop building your own tools. <laughs> People, first ask. We have a very great community where firmware is also a part of. Uh, build, we're building Turn, we're building open source. With all of the open source community terms, we're all working together. Ask us first. There's probably an open source tool already out there before you start building your Android. I have had so many people building their own tools. And people don't realize that in compliance, software is made to build code. Compliance is an afterthought. So when people say like, oh, I just get my open source dependencies, it's so easy. It's, I can tell you, I've been working with it for seven years, it's not. The VMware guys are doing great work on pulling together container, containers. It's incredibly difficult to actually figure out what are your dependencies are. It's way more complex than anybody thinks. But now comes my question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you've talked about this, great talk. Thank you, Edouard. How do you do things at scale, at speed? Because if I look at most organizations that I work with, we're not talking about two dependencies. We're not talking about 3,000 dependencies. We're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dependencies. So how do we do it? So as I said, we do it on a regular basis. So the first time, uh, what we do the first time when you have a completely new project, that takes time. That can take even months, depending on how big the project is and how many open source dependencies it had. It has, but uh, afterwards, after the initial review, you usually either upgrade to a new version or you change very little of uh, the existing dependencies. So doing it on a regular basis, that really help us scale it. And we ask our developers to do it as early as possible. And we have internal tooling solutions integrated with proprietary solution, uh, tooling solution that actually help them the moment they have it in the pipeline and it's uh, in the build system, it's already in our compliance review tool. Great. Um, so thank you for the talk. Um, let's thank the speakers again. <laughs> <laughs>